Before I go into the thick of it, I'd like to um, explain what is the genesis of a cosmetic products regulation and put it in a wider context. In the um, noughties and the beginning of this decade as well, there's been a general move from the, the European um, institutions towards more protection of uh, consumers. And this is especially coming from the endemic problem of counterfeited products invading Europe. So this uh, move <coughs> to protect consumers better, the, ha the health and, uh, and safety of consumers better, as initially struck um, in the food uh, products department. And the European Commission has adopted a, um, a regulation in 2002 laying down the general principles and requirement of food law, establishing the European Food Safety Authority and laying down procedures uh, in matters of food safety. So that was the first step in the beginning of the noughties. Then um, earlier this year, a legal package was adopted by the European Commission, composed in particular of two regulations and a multi-annual um, multi action plan. So there's a proposal of a regulation relating to security of known food consumer products and also a proposal of regulation relating to the surveillance of the market of non-food consumer products. So there are now some stronger obligations and legal requirements to comply with for economic players um, within the EU for all types of consumer products. So to recap, it's not personal, it's strictly business. Don't uh, f think that you are scapegoat, you're in the cosmetics industry, it's going on all over the board in all type of food products or non-food products. And the main reason of this is because of the um, endemic counterfeiting problems. So now, targeting and focusing more specifically on the cosmetic, uh, pro cosmetic products regulation, so what's the story? Why was it adopted? Um, it's basically due to the fact that the um, Directive 76 uh, slash 768 um, on cosmetics was a bit dated. I mean, at the end of the day, it was from 1976. And also, it had been amended so many times, at least five times, seven times, sorry, and um, there were also 50 adaptations of this uh, cosmetics uh, directive. Um, also, some further amendments needed to be made to the, uh, to the um, uh, regulations, the European regulations applying to cosmetics. So the European Commission decided it was best to actually recast the whole set of regulations and provisions into a new, um, a new text, which would be a regulation. So. It was recast in the interest of clarity. What is interesting is that a regulation, as opposed to a directive, is a legal instrument that imposes some clear and detailed rules which do not give room to diverging transposition by member states. As I mentioned before, there were more than 50 adaptations of the 76 <laughs> Directive on Cosmetics. Why? Because a, 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 a directive needs to be transposed in each member state before it becomes um, applicable and enforceable on, on the, at the national level. With a regulation, a European regulation, it becomes automatically uh, uh, applicable um, homogeneously applicable as well in the 28 member states of the European Union. So there's less diverging um, uh, transposition and interpretation of the rules which, which can happen. This regulation specifically aims at simplifying the procedures and streamlining the terminology in order to reduce the administrative burden and any ambiguities. The, um, as I said, it, harmoni it harmonizes the rules in the European uh, Union in order to achieve an internal market for cosmetic products while ensuring a high level of protection of human health. It aims in particular at, well, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but protecting human health, um, again, because there is this big risk coming from counterfeited, counterfeited cosmetic products. 
There's also a uh, desire to um, reduce or actually completely ban animal testing. <coughs> and why? But obviously for ethics reason, but also because lots of the counterfeited products are actually tested on animals. Yes, China says that um, uh, animal testing is, is, I mean, the China authorities, sorry, say that animal testing is, is, is not... Uh, is not possible in, in their country, but I'm fairly sure that on the black market, where they do all the counterfeiting uh, cosmetic products, they will test them on animal. They will have no problem doing this. So again, this is with the ultimate goal of stopping all these counterfeiting cosmetic products coming into Europe. And of the, 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 um, um, another goal of the uh, regulation is to make more information available to consumers. Um, all of you, as economic um, players in the cosmetics industry are going to be held more accountable directly to, to, to uh, retail customers. And there's also a desire for this regulation to uh, regulate the free movement of cosmetics products in the internal market, i.e. within the EU. So the cosmetic products regulation was implemented directly in all member states. It was adopted in, on the 11th of July 2013, uh, sorry, on the 30th of November, 30, 30, 30th of November uh, 2000, as I'm sure you all know, and then it entered into force on the 11th of July 2013, earlier this year. So this completely replaced the directive uh, on cosmetics. And by extension, it also completely replaced most of the national provisions which were adopted by various member states on the cosmetic products. So now, it's this European re regulation, and it applies directly to, um, in each member state to all the players in, the, in, in, in every member state. The legal effects of this regulation are simultaneous, automatic, and uniformly binding in all national legislations. There are two exceptions to this time frame, uh, which are the Article 15 um, of uh, Paragraph 1 and 2 of the regulation, which applied from the 1st of December 2010, and they specifically relate those provisions to the use of CMRs in cosmetic products. And the other exception is Article 16.3, which applied from the 11th of January 2013, where there's an obligation to notify the uh, cosmetics products containing some nanomaterials to the European Commission. So now it applies to all the institutions, every member state, all the individuals to uh, whom this uh, regulation is addressed. And... Um, what is interesting is that you as players in this industry, you really have to keep attuned to the ch further changes which, which will be made to the, to the um, uh, regulation because it's constantly evolving. For example, further to the adoption of the regulation, the cosmetic products regulation, um, two annexes, two and three of the directive from 76 were modified by an executing uh, directive from 2012. So one on, uh, so on capillary substances, um, which were added, set out in the Annex 2 and 3 of the directive. And then, um, because the directive of 76 had been adopted, it meant that these similar changes had to be reflected, reflected in the cosmetics product regulation. And that was done uh, through the regulation um, 658, 2013 of 10th of July, 2013. So sorry if I'm saying all these, these, these um, numerous words and, and numbers as well, but I, the, the bottom of my, of my point is that you really have to monitor and check that the um, ongoing changes made to this regulation because very often the annexes are being amended with new products um, that uh, need to be reported to the European Commission, etc. So what changes were brought by the cosmetics product regulation? Well, further to my thorough analysis of the, um, previous system, the previous legal framework, um, which used to be in place with the cosmetics directive, and the new framework um, set, set up by this uh, cosmetic products regulation, my conclusion is that um, the, changes, the changes are quite minor. It's, it's not been a revolution within your 
uh, within your industry in terms of, uh, of, of roles which are part of the cosmetics product. It's mostly a, a, an overall, a, a, a terminology streamlining clarifications which have been put in place for this uh, cosmetics product regulation. Some of the minor changes which we can mention are um, the relates sorry, to the obligation of a responsible person set out in Article 4 and 5. In the directive the, of 76, the responsible person already existed as a concept, but it was not, not explicitly set out uh, as a concept of a responsible person. Now, Article 4 of the regulation clearly defines what a responsible person is, and it can be either the manufacturer, uh, which needs to be established in the European Union, or the manufacturer's agent, um, when such an agent has provided its written consent and is also established in the European Union, um, or the importer, also established in the, in the European Union, or the importer's agent, again, if, if such agent has provided a written consent and is established in a member state, or the distributor, um, also established in the European Union. So, a um, responsible person can be any natural or legal person in the supply chain, other than the manufacturer or importer. Oh, sorry, a distributor, sorry, can be any legal, natural or legal person in the supply chain, other than the manufacturer or the importer, who makes a cosmetic product available on the European Union market. So, you can see that there are many actors within your industry which today can help the role of uh, the responsible person. Um, and I would strongly suggest that you make a, a wise choice when you select who is going to have such responsibilities. Um, also, the Article 5 of the regulation clearly sets out the obligations um, that such um, responsible person has to comply with. But for example, the responsible persons to in, uh, assure the compliance with the requirements of the regulation, obviously, but in, in more specifically, it has to take some measures to fulfill, withdraw, or recall the product from the market in case of the, this, case this product does not comply with the regulation. It, the responsible person needs to take some corrective measures if needed. Of course, it needs to keep the product information file um, accessible to public authorities, as Richard has mentioned before. And when the, present, the product presents a serious risk, it needs to notify the European Commission, as well as national authorities. Um, this responsible person, as a last example, needs to identify the distributors and different actors of the supply chain in order to allow traceability of a product. Another actor which had its obligations beefed up and is now held more uh, uh, responsible and accountable to, in particular, to the end consumers, the retail consumers, is uh, uh, the distributor. Article 6 of the regulation provides that the it is the responsibility of a distributor to verify the labeling, uh, that the labeling information is compliant. Um, that the language requirement is fulfilled. I mean, it's all very well to have a label, but it needs to be uh, translated in the language in which you actually uh, sell the, um, the, um, the language of the country in which you sell the cosmetic product. Um, the date of minimum durability must be specified on the packaging, and um, of course, the distributor should not make some non-conforming products available um, until they are brought into conformity. Storage and, um, and um, transport conditions also need to be met by the distributor. And the, when a product presents a risk, the distributor must inform the responsible person and um, the competent national authorities of the member state in which the product was made available and give some details of the non-compliance of such product and also the details of the corrective measures which were taken. So all of you um, um, who are either distributors or responsible persons um, need to be aware of all these um, uh, increased responsibilities, responsibilities that are uh, now on your, on your shoulders and make sure that you comply with them, obviously. Another a minor change which was brought up by the uh, regulation is the identification within the supply chain set out in Article 7. Um, now the responsible person has to identify the distributors and um, who supply these, the cosmetic products. The distributor 
itself needs to identify the distributor or the responsible person from whom and the distributors to whom the product is supplied. So any person in the supply chain needs to know where the product is coming from, who, who, who uh, provided it, but f um, s several links down the line. So in terms of um, uh, yeah, keeping records of all this information, it's, it's becoming much, much more in, in important with, with the, this regulation to be able to identify the supply chain. There's an increased due diligence and vigilance obligation uh, for the responsible person and the distributors. And if there is no compliance, then they are in breach of the regulation, which could trigger some sanctions or uh, investigations for um, uh, trading standards, as we heard before, or from the European Commission directly. Compliance with good manufacturing practice, practices, so GMP to um, uh, shorten this, this term, uh, basically manufacturers of cosmetic products must comply with good manufacturing practices with a view to ensuring the objectives of Article 1 of this regulation, uh, basically ensuring the functioning of the internal market and a high level of protection of human health. So there is a presumption of GMP, good manufacturing practice, when the manufacturer um, is done in accordance with the relevant harmonized standards. Um, and in this particular case, the cosmetic products is related to the new ISO EN 22716 cosmetic GMP standard. Um, so as a, um, uh, an economic actor of this, uh, of this um, market of, of cosmetics, it is important for you to verify that your manufacturers have the accreditation ISO EN22716. And last but not least, there are some notification requirements now which have been beefed up in this, um, in this regulation set out in Article 13. Uh, prior to placing the um, cosmetic product on the European market, there's a, a notification by the responsible person which must be done directly to the European Commission. Um, for example, you have, uh, as a responsible person, you have to notify, of course, the name and category of the cosmetic product, the specific identification, the country of origin in case it's an import, the member state in which the cosmetic product is to be placed in the market, or, uh, for example, if it's, um, there's a presence of substances in the form of nanomaterials or uh, substances classified as carcinogenic, mutagenic or toxic for reproduce, reproduction, CMRs of category A1 and AB. As I said before, the, the obligation to notify these um, CMRs was, was advanced um, uh, to an earlier date in, uh, in 2010. And there's also the frame formulation allowing the prompt and appropriate medical treatment in the event of difficulties that the responsible person has to notify to the, um, directly to the European Commission before launching the product in the EU. So when the pro cosmetic product is already in the European market, the responsible person has to notify the European Commission of the original la labeling and of a photo photo some photographies and pictures of the corresponding packaging. So it's quite a detailed notification requirement here. Um, that you have to be aware of. When the cosmetic product is already in a member state and uh, made is made available by a distributor in another member state, this distributor needs to translate, uh, sorry, and if the distributor translates in his own initiative <coughs> any element of the labeling of that product, then the distributor also needs to notify the Europe European Commission. Um, what does it need to not notify this uh, uh, distributor? Well, the category of cosmetic product the name uh, in uh, the member state of dispatch and the name in the member state in which it is made available, um, as well as the distributor's name and address and the name and address to the responsible person where the um, product information file is accessible. There's also a centralized, da a centralized database, uh, the Cosmetic Products Notification Portal, CPNP, which is accessible to all competent authorities. So all these notifications actually go somewhere in this portal and they will be um, viewable at the finger, uh, at, uh, very quickly by any competent authority and the European authorities as well. So uh, you're being watched. Um, okay, and um, very quickly, in market control, uh, which is set out in Article 22, um, 
the member states have now more responsibility in terms of monitoring the compliance with the regulation via in-market controls of cosmetic products made available in market. They have to do some checks of these cosmetic products and of the, cosmetic, the economic operators acting in this, uh, the cosmetics industry through some uh, checking the product information file um, and some physical and laboratory checks on the basis of samples. They need also to monitor the compliance with uh, the principles of GMP for each um, national player. And the member states can entrust the market surveillance, so, some, um, sorry, can entrust to market surveillance authorities the necessary powers, resources, and knowledge in order to, for those authorities to properly perform these tasks. So in England and Wales, as we heard before from Richard Knight, the Secretary of State and Trading Standards um, who are the authorities in charge of, of, of um, making sure that this in-market control is done well. The member states need to periodically review and assess the functioning of their surveillance activities at least every four years, and the results need to be communicated to other member states, the European Commission, and the members of the public. <coughs> so to conclude, there are no major changes brought by this regulation. Um, Although I'm very happy to be here and it's really worth uh, having this summit, but uh, you, I don't think that you should fret that um, your business model has been changed overnight. It's just a, a, uh, many an adjustment uh, um, and terminology streamlining and some clarifications which have been brought up by this um, regulation. As I mentioned, certain obligations are clearer and therefore more stringent, in particular on the responsible person and the distributors. And um, as far as I've seen, most product information file requirements, labeling requirements, and ban on animal testing uh, requirements are more or less the same than in the 76 directive. So in terms of um, the legal review that um, you as, as economic players in the um, um, cosmetic industry have to do, I think that the first port of call is to review your chains of contracts and, and, and also of course these contracts and assess your legal risk vis-a-vis um, -vis those new rules applying to RP, distributors, um, identification within the supply chain, compliance with GMP, notification requirements and in-market controls. There's, I think, a need to involve a lawyer, either an in-house lawyer, if you have some, or a, a private practitioner um, specialized in the cosmetic regulation to do this audit and legal review of your, of your chains of contracts. It's, it's best, I think, to leave such an audit to a legal professional because he or she will be able to deliver the risk from your existing and future contracts and uh, any situation that you may be in uh, with your supply chain and your customers. So in terms of your legal strategy for your contracts, um, I'm just, go I'm just um, going to present a few important contracts which um, are coming up very often in your industry and what you should do with each of them briefly. So the contracts with your manufacturers uh, when they are acting as subcontractors. Well, I think that for those m manufacturing contracts, it's really important to add the adequate pro uh, provisions relating to complying with the GMP, of course, the General Manufacturing Practices, and, um, in, in term, in, and by inserting, setting out some specific undertakings, covenants, representations um, in your manufacturing contracts relating to the fact that your manufacturer needs to comply with the uh, uh, GMP and they also need to provide you on a yearly basis the accredi accreditation that they have obtained the ISO EN22716 cosmetic GMP standard and that it's been re renewed. So that is really important. And um, if you notice some breach of these um, um, undertakings and, and, and representations and covenants, I would suggest that you also put a, um, a clause allowing you to terminate the contract with your manufacturer if it doesn't remedy to such a breach within a reasonable time frame. Also, um, since now there is an option to, ha to choose between you and um, your manufacturer to be the responsible person, it's important to set out in your manufacturing contract who is going to be that responsible person. My personal choice is that it should be you, because um, of course if you are the one who is bearing such uh, responsibilities, then you have more control over 
uh, the, um, how well the obligations of a responsible person are going to be complied with. So you, it, it, it's it's um, in, also important to set out as an annex to your manufacturing contract a, um, an acceptation in writing of the role of a responsible person. And um, therefore, so every, everybody's clear, on, uh, for both parties, sorry, are clear on who um, is the, uh, the responsible person and who has to comply with the obligation of such RP. In terms of the agency agreement, uh, as I mentioned before, it's possible for a, um, a, man, a manufacturer, sorry, it's yeah, it's possible for a manufacturer or, to, uh, to, or an importer to have an agent which is based in the European Union, provided that such an agent has um, accepted in writing to be the responsible person. So if you are a manufacturer or an importer and want to appoint your agent established in the European Union to be your RP, you need to ensure that the agent signs this written consent to this appointment and you need to annex it to your agent's, uh, agency agreement. And um, you, it's also quite important to add all the obligations of the RP um, in the agency agreement so that the agent knows exactly what, um, what he, are his obligations and how he's supposed to, to, to comply with them. I would also suggest to add an indemnity uh, uh, clause in this um, agency contract whereby if you, uh, the, the importer or the manufacturer, get sued because your agent didn't do a proper job, then you will be uh, responsible for paying all the legal fees um, and, um, and also damages, compensation uh, that you might be uh, asked to pay to the, uh, to the, to the person uh, who has brought up the, uh, the claim against you. It's also important to put some strong penalties um, in your agency contract so that the agent knows that he's definitely going to be held accountable to, uh, to, to if he doesn't comply with the obligations of a responsible person. Same drill for the distribution agreements. Uh, if you are a manufacturer and importer, you, you, it's important to modify your existing distribution agreement so that the uh, distributor automatically becomes the responsible person when he places the uh, cosmetic product in, on the market under his name um, or trademark or modifies a product already placed on the market in the way that the compliance with the applicable requirements may be affected. You, you need to ensure that all the obligations of a distributor are, uh, that the distributor has to comply in are set out in the, um, in, the, um, um, in, in the contract and the distribution agreement as mandatory obligations and then to take, take under, undertakings uh, made by this distributor. Again, an indemnity provision would be um, good in this distribution agreement so that if, you're, if you are sued because your distributor did not go, do a good job in a particular member state, then uh, you, uh, you can actually um, ask him to, to pay you back all the, the legal fees uh, and damages that you had to pay to a third party who started a claim against you. I, as I'm sure you know, in the uh, cosmetic uh, world, it's, licenses are very important, um, especially for perfumes and... Um, and um, also, um, yeah, uh, women cos cosmetics. So, if you are a licensor, um, it's important to set out in the licensing agreement that the licensee will have a role and obligations of the responsible person and will comply with each obligations of a responsible person: the notifications, the labelling requirements, the non-testing on animals, etc. Um, if the licensee breaches the regulation, the cosmetic products regulation, then that should trigger a default under the license agreement and a possibility for you to terminate such a license. I mean, for a licensor, the worst that can happen is to get sued or to suffer a, a reputational damage because your licensee um, didn't do a good job or get someone, got someone very, very sick by selling some products, some cosmetic products on... Um, in a member state with your trademark and your logo um, on that product. It will cause an enormous reputational damage to, uh, to your company. So again, a an indemnity clause is, um, should be set out in a license agreement whereby the uh, licensee will have to pay all the, uh, the cost and damages that, that you, you, you might have to pay to a third party that's suing you. And if you are a licensee, well, I guess you're... Um, you, you, you're um, First port of call is to reach out to your lawyer and to make sure that you have um, uh, you have a very clear understanding of what your obligations are under the cosmetic.
pro products regulation, the risks in case of non-compliance, and some suggestions on uh, related to ensuring that you uh, licensee comply with all these um, these uh, obligations. Um, terms and conditions for your retail customers. Well, I think it's important for you to um, amend your, those terms and, and, uh, and, and conditions on your website, at the back of your receipts, if you are a distributor, and, um, and to let your, your retail customers know that your cosmetic products comply with the regulation. So, for example, no animal testing, appropriate lab labeling, etc. Of course, you, you should um, um, update such t terms and conditions and make sure that, that you are 100% uh, compliant with the regulation. Um, I would suggest to have, again, an audit done by your in-house lawyer or a private practice lawyer specialized in the cosmetic product regulation of your supply chain to check that each link um, complies with the provisions of a regulation and its obligations under the regulation. So checking that the manufacturer, the agent, the importer, the distributor, the licensee all comply. Um, a legal review of your labeling is also um, in, the, in the books. Uh, is the labeling compliant with the regulation and reassures your retail customers? There's now also an, an obligation to, um, for, for, for you as an economic um, player in the cosmetics uh, field to give retail customers access to information. It is set out in Article 21 of the regulation. So the responsible person shall ensure the, that qualitative and quantitative composition of the cosmetic product, and for perfume and aromatic compositions, the name and code number of a composition and identity of a supplier be made easily accessible to the public by an appropriate means. So you could do this by putting the information on the labeling or on your website or on your terms and conditions, as, as I mentioned, at the back of your receipts. It's up to you, but um, with your lawyer, I think it's important that you find a solution. In a nutshell, it's important for you to be to deliverage, sorry, to deliverage your legal risk, I think it's important for you to be proactive, um, in particular by devising in advance a plan um, in case a cosmetic product is not compliant. So, for example, um, which phone number or which email address could a, a, um, a retail customer contact you on to let you know that they've become sick because of a cosmetic product? Um, how would you recall the product? Um, how would you... Um, how would you also fix the problem? You need to conduct a legal review of your contracts. Um, if you don't have one, appoint a compliance officer or subcontract a compliance officer and, um, and update your employees' guidelines and handbook because this is a top-bottom approach. Um, the European Commission has taken this regulation. You, as an economic player in the cosmetics world, need to apply with it, but you need to make sure that internally within your own uh, workforce, everybody is aware of what they have to do on a daily basis to actually comply with that regulation. So HR needs also to be um, in, 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 um, um, engaged in this process and um, so, uh, appropriate training given to your staff so that they know how to comply on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think this slide is quite <coughs> self-explanatory, but basically the process to, uh, to um, comply with the Cosmetic product regulation is, um, is, 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 is quite simple. As I mentioned before, there is still no pre-market approval to launch a product in the European <coughs> Union, but you do need to notify um, at the European Commission, sorry, to the European Commission, the, uh, the, the, the new cosmetic product and also um, the product classification, the fact that you have set up the PIF and uh, the product information file and who is going to keep it, um, give, provide a product description, sa the safety report, and the uh, um, confirmation that your manufacturer complies with GMP, etc., etc. In terms of best litigation avoidance practices, I would say that um, uh, you have to make, I mean, you have to come to terms with the fact that you may be sued um, at some point um, by the national authorities, by perhaps trading standards, if, if things um, uh, get a little bit out of control and you don't get a message that, uh, um, that um, basically you are in breach. 
Um, as we heard before, it's the last recourse, but it could happen. Um, yeah, in particular, such a um, um, uh, litigation risk arise from the competent national authorities when some co physical damage has been caused to consumers because of your products. So this is a situation you don't really you don't want to find yourself in, and you have to make sure that you've put in place a lot of. Uh, um, uh, preliminary steps to, to really avoid this, um, ha ha causing some, some, some health damages and safety damages to your consumers. Um, in case there's no compliance with the obligations such as the P for GMP, the ban on animal testing, the labeling, the packaging, the inappropriate translation of product description, you could um, have some problem from the competent national authorities. Same thing for the European Commission. For all these reasons I've just mentioned, you, you, they could, uh, they could uh, start legal action against, uh, against you. But um, there, are, there is also a specific uh, legal case I wanted to mention in, in relation to um, the interaction between the, cosmetics, uh, the cosmetic products regulation and anti-competitive behavior. In um, October 2011, the European Court of Justice published a decision um, about the Laboratoire Pierre Fabre Dermo Cosmetique. And um, the European Court of Justice ruled that the Laboratoire Pierre Fabre Dermo Cosmetique could not use the excuse of um, applying the cosmetovigilance principles under the cosmetic products regulation to actually um, do some anti-competitive behavior. And in particular, in that particular case, the anti-competitive behavior that Laboratoire Pierre Fab Dermo Cosmetic was uh, um, found guilty of was that they were um, forbidding their distributors to uh, sell online any of their products. It was a total ban to sell the, uh, pro the cosmetics products from Laboratoire Pierre Fabre de Cosmetique online. And they justified this, among other reasons, for, with the fact that they wanted to comply with the principles of cosmetovigilance and vigilance and be sure that they were complying with the cosmetic products regulation. Well, the uh, European Court of Justice said to them, no, you can't justify a breach under um, the uh, Article 18 of the European <coughs> Community Treaty, which relates to the uh, free, free um, free market, but market competition cannot be limited with the fact that you actually want to comply with um, cosmetovigilance principles. And of course, you, you could be sued by your retail customers and also by some competitors. How to avoid, avoid uh, litigation? I think that your best port of call is to um, really have a... Uh, a, a, a it's a lot of red tape, but it's the pa paper trail. Um, um, keep the re results of the safety assessment. Uh, keep the product information file for 10 years, following the date on which the last batch of a cosmetic product was placed on the market. Uh, you, you need also to keep all the results from the sampling analysis in a reliable, uh, sorry, so perform some sampling and analysis in a reliable and reproducible manner and use the, some method in accordance with the relevant harmonized standards and keep all these results of the sampling and analysis. Keep some written evidence of all your notifications or copies of the notifications made by the responsible person and or the distributor. Uh, keep some records as well of all your communications with the Euro European Commission, uh, the competent national authorities. Um, retail customers, when they, if they ever comply about your cosmetic products, uh, the, your competitors, which relate to the compliance with the cosmetic product regulation, and keep data on indesirable <coughs> effects and any voluntary declaration that you have made in relation to indesirable effects. So, yes, this is why you do need a compliance officer or a, a very apt in-house lawyer, because you, in, ter in terms of claim substantiation, you really need to uh, uh, keep a record of all this for, let's say, probably 10, 10, minimum 10 years, um, just to make sure that you're on the safe side. Uh, I think also that class action and, and some new regulations, um, in European regulations, are, are, are going to come up soon in terms of class action being able to be done in Europe. So this is definitely going to increase your legal risk. Whenever you have thousands of consumers who can actually sue you uh, for one particular product, 
um, it could become a, a, a major uh, risk when this, um, this regulation, European regulations on class actions uh, come into, into force, into effect. Yeah, this is your best way to uh, mitigate your risk um, through this claim substantiation process I've, I just noticed. And of course, uh, updating your internal and regula regulatory and compliance policies is key. To wrap this up, I'd say that um, the, what, there's a few things that you retain from this presentation, and I'm really sorry because this was a bit raw, I mean, a bit dry, and, you know, the content was a bit dry, but then at the end of the day, I was here to explain to you what the legal aspects of the regulation were, so. Um, but, yeah, uh, when you have some questions, then I hope to, I will be a bit more beaming. So, but what you have to take from this uh, uh, presentation is that you have to streamline your internal compliance systems and risk mitigation processes to ensure the compliance with the regulation. I suggest to, strongly to instruct an expert lawyer to conduct the legal review of your existing contracts and to draft some new templates for your contracts with your suppliers, distributors, agents, licensors, licensees, and terms and conditions for your consumers, all updated, of course, with the uh, requirements deriving from the regulation. Um, develop some collaborative and productive relationships with competent, the competent national authorities of the member states. So, for example, why not you introduce yourself to your uh, trading standards officer if you are based in the UK? Um, in, 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 and also, um, contact, reach out to your, the competent authorities in the member states where you sell, you import, or you manufacture your products. Stay on top of things by joining unions, such as the Union des Fabricants in France, uh, or the Irish Medicines Board. They've made a very good presentation on this regulation a few months ago. And, and these, these type of associations, non-profit organizations or unions, usually provide on a regular basis some information on how to fight against counterfeiting and also could organize some uh, follow-up seminars and training programs on how to ensure that your company complies with the regulations relating to cosmetic compliance. And I suggest also that on a pragmatic uh, uh, stand standpoint, you also have some Google alerts uh, set up on your IT system so that you can be informed whenever there is an amendment to the cosmetic products regulation which has been adopted. Because as I said, it's already been adopted three times since 2009. And um, above all, I'd suggest that you really protect your intangible assets such as your reputation, your know-how, and your trademark. Thank you. If you have any questions.